We all hear a lot about digital transformation, but unless you've been there and done it, it's easy to feel that transformation is a significant challenge that might seem difficult to conquer. That is why we've launched the Good, Bad and Ugly podcast series. Each episode, we talk to people who've been at the heart of transformation and we get under the skin, not just of what they did and how they did it, but how it felt to be at the center of it. My name is Wendy Stonefield and I'm the Hub Executive for London. I'll be your host for today. I am delighted to welcome our guests, Katie Pender, of the MD of the Target Group, and Mark Gilliver, the Chief Growth Officer of Target Group. It's lovely to have you both with us today. Thank you. Um, Katie is responsible for applying her extensive experience to Target's technical, operational, and digital capabilities to drive disruption and innovation in the mortgage market. Her primary focus is enhancing the customer experience. Katie has a wealth of experience when it comes to the mortgage market and outsourcing, often focusing on establishing new entrants in the mortgage market. Great to have you with us, Katie. Thank you. Mark has a wealth of experience, 20 plus years in business process outsourcing in the financial services sector. At Target, he is responsible for business development, solutions and bids. He's focused on alignment of the go-to-market activity with the parent company, Tech Mahindra, bringing together expertise across IT outsourcing, business process outsourcing, and digital transformation and customer experience. Right, we are going to jump straight into our discussion today, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, if you could each, and we'll start with you, Katie, tell us a little bit more about the target group and your role within it. Um, so Target Group is a business processing outsourcer and software house uh, and we've been established in the UK for the last 40 years. In 2016 we were acquired by Tech Mahindra and with that came great capability in terms of our software development. What I've been working on is the development of the Mortgage Hub which is our mortgage origination software. So really looking to as you say, disrupt the mortgage market through software and innovation. And that's something which TechM are known for. And we as Targa are adding the expertise in terms of the financial services, particularly mortgages, into that dynamic to really create something special. That's great. And um, Mark, if you could give us some background in terms of uh, your role um, that you play within Target. Yeah, not much to add about <clears throat> Target Group over over and above what Katie said, other than when we joined the Tech Mahindra um, family, it wasn't just joining a big parent organization. We joined a portfolio of companies. So Tech Mahindra are quite an acquisitive mm -hmm. organization and continue to be. So there's lots of other businesses um, inside and outside the UK, which really complement um, some of the work that we're doing right now. What I do, um, I, I guess I wear a few hats. I'm, I'm accountable for Target's growth. Um, targets revenue growth. So that includes uh, identifying and onboarding new client logos, um, but equally trying to drive more strategic organic growth into our existing client base as well, um, which is something we're working really hard on now. Um, I've had a variety of roles here, including business development and, and the role that I do now. Um, I joined at a similar time to Katie, and so I've been really close to the mortgage hub development work too. We'll be coming in from more of a sort of commercial market and strategy perspective rather than from a technology point of view. That's great. Thank you both. Um, so really, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to get into some of the detail of, about what the target group has set out to do. Um, and I know you guys have been super busy um, in terms of um, innovating in the mortgage market. So I'm keen to understand more about that um, and really why you've gone uh, about doing that. Sure. So, um, when I joined Target, I'd worked in the mortgage industry in the majority of my career. And a lot of that was launching new lenders into the mortgage market. And the one thing that struck me was that we always created um, mortgage software with the end user in mind, so maybe the broker or the customer. But very little was focused on the operation. And my role predominantly was managing operations. And the systems weren't particularly efficient. They weren't. They didn't offer a good user experience for the operational people, like underwriters and um, the call center staff who deal with mortgages. 
But other than that, the legacy technology that I had to work with was stark. And actually, it meant that as an industry, we couldn't be dynamic. When challenges arose, it took us a long time to get our technology technology to catch up uh, with the changes that we needed to make. And that all ultimately led to lots of manual workarounds. And it became hugely inefficient. And what we were seeing in the mortgage market was a rate of not only low interest rates, but very low margins. Um, so in order to maintain competitiveness and profitability, then one of the ways to do that was to reduce operating costs. Um, so when I joined Target, I was given an, an amazing opportunity to create something which would solve all the problems that were faced in the mortgage market with legacy technology, with um, legacy compliance, with manual operational processes, and really create something new that hadn't been considered before. Um, and that is what we want to be our legacy in terms of, you know, creating something really special, um, but very user centric. And um, we'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, but that's <clears throat> predominantly what we set out to do. And ultimately, I think what we have achieved. I think it's really fascinating when you use the, you, you use the phrase "I was given the opportunity," and I think I, I'm interested in understanding more about what do you think it is about Target? Is it the is it the culture in the organisation? Because I think probably a lot of people would have known that it was ripe for disruption, mm. but there's certain organisations that obviously had haven't made that shift that you guys have. I think um, there was various factors. The support and backing of Tech Mahindra was was crucial mm -hmm. because they were able to fund um, the investment in which what we needed. And I think that's maybe where others didn't have that that level of fortune. And to Mark's point, we're not just one organisation. Uh, Tech Mahindra had acquired lots of other organisations, and what we were able to do was bring the skills and expertise of those complementary uh, organisations together and work as one, whereas lots of other organisations would have had to have gone out and sourced that from different places, different organisations, and work um, cross-functionally, whereas we all had that within the mm -hmm. kind of Tech Mahindra family. So that gave us a, a significant head start uh, ahead of anyone else. And also, uh, within Target Group, we are really fortunate in the number of um, financial services, specifically mortgage clients that we have. So it gives us great insight into the challenges that lenders are facing. Uh, and again, not many other um, software organisations would have that same level of, of insight that we were fortunate to have. Yeah, that's great. Interesting to understand the background to what enabled and, and facilitated the change that, that you guys have got set about um, creating. I suppose there's a tendency when a lot of people talk about digital transformation to focus on the technology. Um, but I suppose probably the three of us would agree that it's so much more than that. So what do you, um, what did you do from a customer user experience process, people capability perspective, I don't know. So before we even thought about design, the first thing that we did, and we did it for about four months, was just conduct user interviews. And when I say user, I mean anyone that's got a part to play in the mortgage application process. So we interviewed um, first time buyers, people who were thinking about buying their first home, seasoned buy to let landlords, uh, all different types of intermediaries, brokers, conveyancers, um, underwriters, call centre staff, uh, commercial um, lenders, to really understand what they needed from the journey and what it meant to them. And we conducted hundreds of hours of user research to understand what those needs and demands were. And only then, when we truly understood those, did we start on the design. And then we looked at technology and then we looked at the compliance. And I think often what people do is they start with the journey as it is today mm -hmm. and it all that's really happened in the past is they've taken the kind of paper mortgage application and they digitalize it um, and people do variations of that and we want to reimagine the whole mortgage application um, process and that's exactly what we did by starting with the users and we haven't just done that as a one-off um, we are the, the Mortgage Hub development team are a truly agile team. We're all agile practitioners. So 
every time we go to iterate and develop, we are bringing the users back in. We're asking them to test prototypes before we develop it so that we can refine it so that it does actually meet the needs of the users. No, that's great. And and so much in there to unpack. But I know, and I think, Mark, we've touched on this previously when we've spoken, that sometimes, particularly when there's a pressure um, within, within a client organization to deliver something, a product, an experience, um, that user research piece that goes back to really a blank sheet of what are we really setting out to do here is, is often a a, a, a part of the process yeah. can come under immense pressure. So there, there's sometimes a tendency to do exactly, to fall back on not really reimagining the process. I don't know, Mark, if you've got anything you want to add to that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I have. So I think at an industry level, um, you're, you're absolutely right in what you say. Well, I think you're right in what you say. At an industry level, the mortgage market has just been in, inherently lazy. Um, and I think the reason why it's been allowed to be lazy is if I'm speaking in plain English, it's been able to get away with it for, for years and years and years. So if you can, if you even today, when you've got disruptive technology and um, solutions coming into the market, like, like, like the target solution, for example, um, if you compare the journeys that people who want something as that's pretty simple as a mortgage compared to other consumer finance journeys, like, you know, current account banking, credit cards, et cetera, it couldn't be, it couldn't be further apart. Right. So I think that's why that type of approach is accepted in, in, in organizations. Um, I'm sure there are still way, way more bad processes that are digitized than to your point, taking the time and getting the right level of investment, not to go straight to that. Um, you just end up with a, a slightly faster or yeah. slightly less painful thing, which is still really, really bad and evil at its core, you know. So, so no, I think um, we were really fortunate to be given the ability to to approach it in that way. And the other interesting thing about it is that's a sort of a reusable approach as well. So when you when you've done that and you've proven through the feedback that you get from users of the service, be they intermediaries, lenders, consumers, conveyances, that that it sets the solution apart from anything else that's on the market, you can drive that into your organization as best practice. So you can drive it in for other types of transformation activity that you're doing because it's not just about origination, right? You know, it's about everything that happens after that too. So, so I think it's a really important point. It's really interesting. And um, I suppose the tendency <clears throat> sometimes is also that people who've worked in a sector for a long time you know, they, they do know it really well. And mm -hmm. so there is almost a tendency to say, well, we know what our customers, you know, or our end users think mm -hmm. about this. I mean, were there any particular surprises along the way or things or nuggets that you uncovered that otherwise had you not been through that process, you wouldn't have done? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's our user research that uh, flushed that out. So, um, and it, there was, there's some conflict in the journey with the different users. So we spoke to people who had gone through the mortgage application process. Um, and as we know, the majority of mortgages in the UK are originated via brokers. So they would have an initial call or meeting um, with a broker and they would receive advice. And then they would go into a period of anywhere between four and six weeks with great uncertainty around what was actually happening. You know pay slips would be requested, bank statements, but they didn't know. And for a first time buyer, mm. the excitement of buying that first home was always, there was always a shadow cast over it by, will we get the mortgage? You know, what is going to happen? What is happening now? And they felt that they went into a bit of a an abyss for a while until they actually received the mortgage offer. And only then did they know that, you know, things were going to move. So their feedback was, it would be great if we knew that each stage of the process, what was happening, you know, had we been accepted, why they needed pay slips and bank statements, were they okay, were they not? So in our designs, we created functionality and we still have got it there, um, where at key parts of the mortgage application process, the mortgage hub system can send notifications, not only to the broker, but to the broker's customer to say your decision in principle has been accepted or your valuation's been instructed, your valuation's been um, conducted, and here's the value of your property. <clears throat> and we 
we're all high five on ourselves because we thought this was the best thing ever and the applicants loved it and we tested it with brokers and they hated it they hated what we had done because they felt that they should own the relationship with uh, the consumer and manage that relationship through so its functionality was switched off for the time being um but that was that was a massive thing we spent so much time developing it and again they they didn't like it and we, we've had something a little bit similar with open banking um we have inter- introduced open banking at the very beginning of the journey because it gives greater um certainty in the lending decision but brokers um still are a little mistrustful of open banking in that prior to submitting a case they can look at the applicant's bank statements and they can see what's there and if the the customer has to change their behavior for a period of time then the broker can obviously advise on that with open banking we're kind of taking away that level of control so um i think everyone sees the value in open banking um but there is still a bit of reluctance um from the broker community to use it and again we found that that out through our, our research with brokers so yeah there's been and i could go on there's there's lots of things like that where you know one group of users mm. thinks it would be really valuable and others feel that it would really um compromise their part the part that they play in the mortgage application process i mean it's super interesting because i suppose what you you're speaking to is one of the challenges of developing a product such as one you have um where you sometimes get that conflict um are, are, were there any other particular challenges that you came across that you'd like to share we had um so we had an amazing opportunity and didn't have to rely on any legacy technology and that's fantastic to be able to do that however that did come with its own problems so we hired one of the best CTOs lead engineers whatever he prefers to call himself um who came up with an amazing technology stack and it is a um, market leading the problem is that it was so market leading the ability to recruit the right resources who were trained and had the skill set to work on it proved to be a little bit of a challenge um so i spoke a bit about tech behind the scale and software development and typically we would utilize um all of that skill set the problem that we had was in the mass empire that is tech mahindra we at that time didn't have people who had the levels of skill and experience because the technologies we were using were so new at the time and so cutting edge and that um created us some problems with our development um in in the early days I mean it's interesting because both both of the challenges I, I suppose if you look at the different stakeholder groups um you know and and then talking about the technologies as a, a different challenge and the scarcity of capability I suppose they both challenges that are um linked to maturity whether it's maturity of um a new technology in the market and having breadth of capability available or you know you've got consumers who are at one end of the spectrum in terms of their expectations of a digital service or or product they they're interpla- interfacing into um but actually you've got one stakeholder group that's still holding on to relationships they both are relatively linked to maturity i don't know if you'd agree mark i think um yeah i think you got the <clears throat> it's it's probably a it's probably becoming a bit of an overused um phrase but i think unless you look at it through um a process that's enabling somebody to buy a home rather than someone acquiring a mortgage then you're you're always going to come across sort of internal challenges be that investment be it you know the alignment of capability to Kate to Katie's point etc you, you can't treat a mortgage application process in the same way you would most other financial transactions there's very little emotion associated mm-hmm. with most financial transactions you know no one gets that excited about opening a current account right and if you and if it's a bad journey then you get halfway through it and you just go and open a different current yeah. account you're so invested you know the so when you're fighting rightly so to make sure that everything that Katie describes comes true that it's uh, a beautiful frictionless 
like easy process. And that means you do have to hire the best in industry. You have to invest, you have to take time, et cetera. Clearly that comes with challenges that you have to overcome you know, within your own organization and other stakeholders that you're dependent upon. Because I think to a point you made earlier on, they want to get there quickly. Yeah. Um, and they'll quite often sacrifice, maybe not sacrifice quality, but some of the really important things. Yeah. The yeah. compromise would be a good word. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And, you know, I think so many people, when you talk about the emotional aspect mm. of going through a mortgage process, there is a lot that people are invested. If you found a property you love yeah. um, and it, you, it's a hearts and minds process, I suppose, because you do flip from very rational, um, you know, dealing with getting bank statements and everything to the really emotional aspect that you've pointed out. It's your home. Yeah. You know, you've, a lot of people move when they're having children or growing families. And exactly. so there is a lot of emotion invested in it as well. And I suppose for most people, it's their biggest investment that they will make during their lifetime is, is their home. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and I, I suppose I'm, I'm like you are both very passionate about uh, user centered design. Um, and putting that at the heart of the project and the initiative. I'm really um, interested in understanding your kind of methodology for keeping that at the heart of the process. And, you know, it's it, it's easy. We've touched on tech becoming very tech driven um, or as some people call it, the tail wagging the dog um, versus the other way around. But, you know, how do you keep the user at the heart of what you do um, within the business? Um, I think so, as I mentioned, we are a truly um, agile team and this is a product it's not just a piece of software so in that we have a product backlog we continue to develop and refine it um, we do it, within any design we are bringing the users back in we're asking them to test um, and to refine and give us that feedback and we continue to iterate the product and we, we will continue to do so because that is what is going to make it different from our competitors um, we used behavioural scientists so that we know things like the design, the colour palette won't cause cognitive overload. Um, and what we've been able to evidence is the increased interaction between the user and the um, the software. So it's really important to us to continue to do that. Um, and that's just now part of our development cycle that we have to do user testing um, and then continue to get user feedback from all um, stakeholders mm -hmm. within the, the journey. So it's kind of like a non-negotiable part of how you have evolved your ways of working as a team. Yeah, I think there's another, I think Katie's right to bring up, you know, the concept of product as well is if you think back to where it started and what we did versus what we didn't do mm -hmm. about the important stuff, doing the important stuff, first. product ownership, you know, on this solutions roadmap and life cycle is, is critical. But product ownership, looking at it through the lens of the way that it was created rather than, you know, are we definitely on the right piece of technology here? There's an interesting sort of bit of third party. Maybe there's a slightly better open banking product. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But product ownership, looking at it from a user perspective, you know, rather than from a, a technology perspective. Yeah. So that's going to be, I think, from my point of view, that'd be critical for the long long term success so. yeah it was super interesting yeah. and you know i suppose people are always always it's lovely to hear the success stories um a lot of people who might be on um the beginning of their journey of a transformation are also really keen to hear about you know from leaders such as yourself who've been through a digital transformation you know what you know what are the elements that did work straight out of the gate um but also it, you know what were the big learnings um and uh, people love to hear the war stories as well, right? And the things that went wrong and, you know, like what are the things that you've discarded along the way? Do you want to go first? Yeah. All right. Um, stick to your strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it was so exciting uh, for us, but we decided to start to tell prospective clients about the solution that we were building relatively early in its yeah. life cycle. Um, with hindsight, probably slightly too early um, and that created interest from potential clients who had a very, very specific set of needs and therefore would wanted to take the product design and the development in a certain direction. Um, and we didn't fall foul of it, but we, we got caught up with that a couple of times. So 
it wasn't a straight path to where we are now. We sort of went on a few a few twists and turns. Um, so I think we could have probably got there a little quicker um, and probably spent a little less time and money if we'd stuck to our guns from the outset. You, 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 you make great contacts and networks and hopefully those people will become clients. But um, but yeah, stay, stay on a path would be something I'd, I'd say we, we learned from. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I think we, we were. We were so um, excited to launch and yeah. to have, you know, our first client live that it did influence in our thinking um, and did some at times take us in different paths. But we, you know, we used, because we used Agile development, part of that is, you know, you are going to fail if, and it's about how you recover from it. So we did have, we had to change our, um, our technology stack at least once because at the time, we didn't we employed someone who maybe didn't have the right vision um, as we we did, and when that quickly became apparent, we had to change direction. And again, you know, we we struggled with the re recruitment and resources, and we tried to do it differently. We tried, you know, um, upskilling on the on the role, and it just that didn't really work for us. You know, we needed people who were who were really experienced. And it ultimately what it did was it just slowed us down and we, we spent a lot of time trying to paint, uh, train people um, in role and it, it wasn't that successful. Um, and that caused you know us to increase our overall times to, to get to the end of development. So we had so many bumps in the road. You know, at some points we, we worried that we couldn't see the way back from them. Um, but it, it is difficult, but you just need to um, always keep your solution in mind. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good advice and have the resolve and to keep going. And I, it's interesting what you say about the agile mindset and evolving that. And, I, I, you know, I'm interested in the journey that you took the group along, because I suppose I, I have no doubt you have internal stakeholders that needed to you know, journey through this with you. Are there any tips in terms of how you kept the organization along? Yeah, I think it was, so Target um, has got lots of proprietary software uh, other than the Mortgage Hub, but um, it is legacy technology. And then um, a group of people like me, Mark and I uh, were recruited, didn't come from necessarily that same technology background came in with our agile ways of working where that wasn't standard practice. So there was quite a lot of uh, resistance initially around, you know, um, who, who we were and what we were doing. Uh, so we had to to get people to trust us and buy into what it was we were doing. And the only way to do that was to allow them to really see the benefits of what we were doing and the benefits of um, agile working and a part of it was the fear of the unknown. It was just wasn't a practice they were um, that comfortable with. Uh, so we started development kind of pre-COVID and we would reach out to invite them into our workspace to come and see the team, to understand what we were doing, um, what was involved in sprint planning, uh, what we were doing from a retro, just from an observational perspective, because then the more that they understood it, the more easy it was then to get them to buy in to what it was we were doing and to see the benefits of it. Um, so it was a, it was hard work because we had to give that level of engagement. We had to really get them to support what it was we were doing and bring them on the journey with, with us to see um, what they could also get out of it um, as we embedded it then into the culture of, of the group. And it took us, a, it's not quick and it never was going to be. So it's taken us a while to do that and we're seeing that now become far more of a standard practice mm -hmm. to use those agile methodologies because they have seen the benefit of it and what we've delivered. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like as the organisation you would have had impact way beyond um, the product that you were working on by, by, I suppose, role modelling and showcasing what agile and product mindset can bring. Target's not unlike any <clears throat> organization that does very, very well through very complex sort of transformations. You know, banks do it, do it every day. And, you know, waterfall approaches to projects has done and still can operate very, very successfully there, especially when you're including, I don't know, things like data migration for it. You know, it's it's so critical. So 
to attempt to embed a different approach to um, project management and development into an organization. It's not, not just Target Tech Mahindra as well, that are very, very good at running in a relatively traditional way is going to be tough, right? So all of the things that Katie mentioned have to be done. But also, I think when people um, join demonstrations of the solution in its earlier years, and they were they, they saw the way that clients were sort of responding to it and <clears throat> took feedback, then that helped drive some 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 belief and some acceptance in a different way of working as well. So yeah, really, really interesting. And, you know, we work with a lot of people who are somewhere on that journey, um, but also have, there's a place still in their organizations for a more traditional style of delivery both, right? as well. Yeah, you yeah. need both. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, where would you say you're up to at the moment and now um, in terms of the product and, and the transformation, I, I suppose, do you feel like it's it had the impact that you all hoped and dreamed it would have for you as an organization? Um, I think so, but it's a true product, so we never stop. I think when we are showcasing the capability, showing people now the live um, platform and what we've created, the reaction um, is, are always really positive. And, you know, it's kind of uh, gives you the reassurance that what we've done was needed, was wanted, and that people absolutely can see the benefit of what we've done. But we so we take some reassurance from that, but we know that it's a competitive environment uh, and, you know, we always have to kind of keep one step ahead of the competition, but we do need to evolve it like a product. So whilst we have got the product completed now to a marketable product and we're delighted with that, um, this is only the beginning for us. We need to keep on going and continuing to to work to really invest and involve the product. Um, so from my perspective, it's, you know, we, we took a minute to stand back and breathe, but it's back to uh, back to the grinds again on it. No resting on your laurels. We're, um, we're in the process of working with our first major client on the hub now, which is a really exciting, and that, that's testament to the point that the teams have got the product to, to where it is. Um, so, so yes, not, not fully done yet, but, but close. Um, and that'll be a very, very exciting sort of step in the journey of, 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 of the hub, you know, to, to get our household name on board as well. That'll help us greatly. So. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And how would you say, what difference has it made to Target's capability that you have? So Target is, um, it, it will make a huge difference to Target's capability. So, um, <clears throat> Target has operated within the what we describe as the origination space from time to time in its in its past. So clients that are writing new loans or taking new deposits, you know, et cetera. But a lot of Target's business has been servicing portfolios of assets that um, we describe as a closed book. So things that stopped originating for whatever period of time, um, which is great because there, there are customers and consumers and human beings in that that you still need to care for and you can do an excellent job. But to grow as an organization by just doing that type of activity is very, very difficult because closed book portfolios get smaller because people redeem their mortgages, you know, and people, mortgages expire, et cetera. So what the hub will allow us to do um, with a level of self-sufficiency is to really, really penetrate the originations market, which means that as we're onboarding clients, we, we want at least 50% of our new logos moving forward to be what we describe as originating clients rather than closed clients. That, that's going to help massively from a, um, uh, a growth perspective. What it also will allow us to do, the other key difference it will make, it will allow us to um, become an even, even more meaningful portfolio within our overall group. Um, there is no reason why um, this solution has to reside in the UK. Um, it, the way that it's been designed and built and hosted, et cetera, will allow us to, with some changes, take it outside of the UK environment as well. So international expansion and growth would be a couple of a couple Fantastic. of key areas. Yeah. yeah, really exciting. Yeah. And we're all those things, you know, it's really interesting. We're all those things in mind when you originally started working on the product. Or have, has there a lot in terms of opportunity that's come to the fore as you've been going through the process? Yeah, I think um, it's evolved in a way that we didn't imagine mm. at first. So it's part because 
um, Tech Mahindra had invested so significantly in the product, they obviously wanted to do some independent validation of what we've built and what we've created. So we call it Mortgage Hub because when we sat down and initiated our design, that's that's the uh, asset class that we wanted to play in. And they made an observation that it could be asset agnostic. You know, they're saying, well, actually, the way in which you built it, you could use it for car finance, mm -hmm. you could use it for unsecured lending. To Mark's point, now we're starting to see um, some interest in um, adjacent markets and um, worldwide markets as well, where actually it wouldn't take a significant level of redevelopment to reuse components or the um, the platform in its entirety. And I think when we sat in that first day, coming up with you know what it was we were going to create, we never for a minute thought that it could expand in, in those ways. Yeah, it's really interesting. And when I think back, you know, I've been working in the space for over 30 years. That is the one thing that I find really exciting about working in an agile way is that, you know, in the old days, we did lock everything down and you were managed as a client through a change control process. And it almost became prohibitive cost wise um, to be agile and to make those um, to go through those learnings and build them into a product when you were on the journey. Mm -hmm. It was almost like the, the, you know, the prevention of innovation once you were in the process. Um, so really exciting um, to hear that you, you've been able to evolve it in that way and, and recognize the opportunity that, it, that it's giving you. Um, can we talk about um, more about the employee experience that was at the heart of this and what, have, what it felt like and was like for, the, for you and the teams working alongside and into you both to go on that journey? Um, I think I think it's been mixed. Um, I think uh, what's been really exciting. So if you think about existing and, you know, um, impressively tenured people who work inside our organization to have you know, like an agile team um, sort of dropped into that environment, working in a very different way on a very different type of product um, um, has definitely presented it's challenges, but has been really, really exciting as well um, because it's opened people's eyes to new ways of working. It's allowed people to take and test best practice, you know, outside of that particular um, environment as well. Um, so I think it's been some really exciting um, benefits from an employee experience there. Um, I think the, you know, on the flip side of that, if we're being completely open, I think from time to time as we've tried to bring the development team, if, if, if we're going to call it that, the design and development team that Katie described into um, Target as a home, I think that's probably caused some frustrations as well yeah. from time to time because, you know, these, because again, because of the differences in working mm -hmm. practice approaches, but also just the type of solution it is compared to a lot of what Target and Tech Mahindra have done in its core for years. So I think the employee experience has been quite mixed in the round, great but um, has needed to be managed along the way. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, some of us working on it, it's been new and exciting. And some people are working opportunities which maybe weren't as new and shiny. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it, it, that created some resentment around, you know, so it's about, it was about how we made sure that those people who had a real interest could get involved in, in it in some way, shape or form. Um, so it was, it was a difficult balance. Uh, as we went along the way, which was, you know, really exciting for those of us who were fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to work on it, and but maybe not so much for those who we needed their skill set to be working on other things. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one. And you often hear with organizations that set up innovation teams within those organizations, there's the, the, there is sometimes a risk of a them and us culture building. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, around that and how you kind of have mobility for people around being able to get exposure to the experience as well. Um, any Anything surprising that you've learned about um, the em employees as you've traversed the journey in particular that you'd want to call out? Um, I think people are more adaptable than you might think. And I think when we started on the journey in um, some people who had worked in the organisation for a long time and were very set in their ways and 
had particular methodologies of doing things. Um, we've slowly seen them uh, support and they change their attitudes and perceptions and actually, um, you know, start to see the benefits. So it's really changed the way that they work. Whereas at the beginning, it seemed like it was, you know, it was going to be impossible for them ever to see things from a different perspective. Um, so I think that has been um, eye-opening to show that people really, you know, can change you, as, as providing you, you know, by you spend the time and invest the time in them, then they definitely will. I think there's another another thing that's um, been interesting is ultimately with projects like this, you're asking people, typically very senior people and, and, and committees for time and money and quite a lot of time and quite a lot of money. Um, it's been interesting to see how important it is for domain experience, i.e. real understanding in mortgages and consumer finance within the executive teams that we've interacted with to be there in order for that time and money to be afforded in the right, in the right way. Um, we've definitely had times where we've had challenging conversations where people have looked at it and said, well, it's just a, it's just it's just a platform, right? Why, you know, why that, that we should be able to do that twice as fast for for half the cost. But again, it's going back to the top of the conversation we had around the user at the center of everything you do, the importance of spending the time and getting that bit right. So education upwards as well as out in across your teams has been um, has been an interesting experience. Yeah, it's really and it comes back to your point you're making is don't go get veer off your strategy and why no. you're doing it in the first place. Yeah. Um it's super interesting. Um, I suppose, like I always say, digital. Not everybody's got the appetite for digital transformation. You know, the journey. The journey is often really challenging in a host of different ways, some of which we've touched on. But I suppose, what was the moment where you thought, "I reckon I and we can do this"? Um, you know, and for you as digital leaders, and um, you know, leading leading the charge in terms of the change internally. Were there any pivotal moments that come to mind? Uh, I mean, one for me was when um, organisationally we um, accepted that this wasn't something we could do on our own. Um, that was a, that was a pivotal yeah. moment. I mean, Kate, you talked about the. I mean, our group has got an incredible set of expertise across the world with with really really complicated can't fail stuff that they do every day but this is quite unique the, the journey that we were going on um accepting that we would need help from other best in class organizations and people in the industry was a pivotal moment as soon as we got past that then our progress accelerated so that would be a key point for me yeah same that's the same key point that was yeah. the the moment where i genuinely knew we were going to do it um and we had that and also some changes in the kind of senior management team at the time and they really understood the value of it. So the kind of upward stakeholder management became a whole lot easier because they understood what it was we were trying to achieve. And it just felt that we had everyone's buy-in at that point. And it was, it made such a difference. And looking back, that was actually the turning point for us. So it's been very difficult up until then. And the relationship that's been built between, you know, what we're talking about here is a relationship between Target Group and Ann Digital, and that has been incredibly exciting, you know, and really, really uh, um, reassuring to know that you're, you know, you're you're in the hands of people who, beyond understand what they're doing and are very, very innovative in their thinking. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, as you look back on um, the 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 um, journey you've been on, what would you say is your and you know, to use the word cringiest moment um, that that you've experienced. <laughs> Just the one. Um... You can go first with this one. <laughs> uh, I think so. Mark talks about um, you know we we were probably a bit over ambitious uh, at the the beginning in terms of getting potential clients buy in, and we. Um, we knew that we didn't have a stable development environment, but um, had tried to do a live demo with a client and it failed miserably and it was a very high profile client and a very, very big deal of which Mortgage Hub was only a small component. Um, 
in it at everything that could have gone wrong. Um, absolutely went wrong in that demonstration. Like, you know, if I would have been happy for the floor to eat me up and swallow me. Uh, so lots of learning from um, from that, but yeah. Well, thanks for your your openness around that, Katie. And I, I think, you know, you, you make me think of something else that I think is such a massive component when, when you're doing something such as what you've done is is the resilience as as an individual as well who's kind of accountable and responsible for the work that you're doing anything you'd like to say on that is how did you keep yourself going and uh, lots of wine <laughs> <laughs> i like that yeah. <laughs> it was um it, there were points where it would have been so easy to give in and just give up because it at points i did think this is you know too difficult and I had invested a lot of myself in it, so it wasn't even just when things didn't go right. I took it really personally and it, it impacted how I felt. Um, but when I felt like that, I thought about the investment of um, time and people and the trust that they had you know, put um, in me to go away and create something with this, um, this big stack of cash that they had invested and just knew that I couldn't, I couldn't let those people down. Um, so no matter how bad things were, we just had to get up and the rest of the team looks to you. So if you're the one that's resilient and you know, given the motivation we can do it no matter how difficult it is, then you can bring the team on the journey and you you keep the team contained in that, that way. So we're actually all kind of supporting and motivating each other. Um, but I just, and I believed in the product. I knew that, the market needed it and you from the engagement from clients the market wanted it so in those dark and difficult days and times then um that's what i had to think about to kind of keep it keep it going thank you for sharing that mark anything from you in particular cringiest moment it was definitely the demo. Definitely <laughs> the demo. No, it was definitely the demo. I mean, that's we talk about lessons learned, like mm. stick to your strategy, stay in your lane, you know, take the right amount of time. We just we broke every rule um when when that happened and didn't repeat it. So that you, it's fine to make a mistake. Mm. It's, it's not not very okay to make exactly the same mistake twice, right? So so we learned from that. Um I think the, the point around resilience though is is key i mean that, that's that wasn't a big enough problem just to like say oh we're just going to stop the project or you know you have to accept that you're gonna in, in any in any walk of life you're gonna hit, hit, hit a hurdle like that that's going to make you feel bad and make other people feel bad um but checking in with people that are really supportive be they potential clients, be they advisors, be their execs as to whether the belief that we had in the product was still something that was shared outside of that group was also really helpful, right? You know, there were plenty of times where we would be in internal meetings and we'd be sharing some difficult or bad news. And, you know, there'll be people on that call saying, right, that's fine. But, you know, think back to why we started this, think back to what it will achieve in the, in the long term um, and stick with it, right? Mm. So um, support from, your broader network and from your client network has been really important as well. Yeah, that's great. And um, I suppose the transparency around it and the reality yeah. is, as we said, it is difficult and things do go wrong and will go wrong. How you deal with that and how you share that news and when you share that news um, is, is really important, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate the openness around that. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I often say to our teams, um, what we're doing with clients um both for yourselves but also for our clients mm. these are these are often career defining initiatives and programs um so i suppose you know for your teams internally as well to have been part of this for them will be very significant it is and i think you know to matt's point when we when we started to work with Anne, that was a that was a the kind of defining moment of we knew we were going to complete it um and i think we've seen the same from the the desire from the other teams and and to support and want to work in the product as well like it's really gratifying to see that and and feel that that you know not just we have um the belief but other people see the potential in it and want to to get involved yeah definitely that's 
that um, is is lovely to hear, and I can the, the sense of camaraderie and and one team is very palpable, you know, in your words as well. And uh, you know us well at Ant, and you know uh, we all have and titles that denote something about us as human beings, not just our, our work and job titles. And uh, I think I have shared with you both that my my and title is Dachshund Fanatic because my household is ruled by a miniature Dachshund called Heidi. Um, I would love to know what your respective and titles are, whoever wants to go first. I'll go. I was actually gifted uh, my and title by the, the uh, and Hamilton team. Um, because they asked me at first and I couldn't think of anything and after a few nights out they gifted me the name of Wino Dog Mum. I love that. Um, <laughs> because I uh, like drink wine and also have a, a little dog, Harry. Oh, that's lovely. What kind of dog is Harry? He is Bichon Frise. Oh, we'll have to exchange photos. <laughs> yeah. Mark, what is your title? <laughs> mine, so mine went straight to football and specifically Arsenal Football Club, but I couldn't go, I couldn't carry on down that journey. Um, I, I, I actually don't know Christian's um, and name, but I, it could quite possibly have something to do with the same football club. So anyway, I, I moved away from that. So I thought about my own name and I, rem I reflected on a time where I decided to research my name, um, my surname, which is quite unusual, which is Gilliver. So my research took me in two different directions. One, of, one piece of research told me it was a, an ancient Scottish name, albeit, unfortunately, the name was closely related to gluttony. So I decided I didn't like that. <laughs> so I carried on researching. And I found another path into a, a medieval Germanic title, which was um, describing a job that protected villages against wolves. So I'd like my and name to be the protector of villages against wolves. It's very purposeful, isn't it? Go. Very deep and purposeful. Better than I a do. glutinous Scottish yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, probably. I probably would have gone the same way as you, but I didn't know you were a gunner as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. My well, son is. Oh, um, good for you. You had a good, a good game yesterday. It was excellent yesterday. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, my neighbours weren't very impressed with the noise. With but the noise. No, but it was a good, it was a good game yesterday. It's been an absolute delight to speak to you both and learn more about your journey. And uh, thank you very much for sharing it with us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do remember to follow or subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode to enjoy. And Digital is on a mission to help close the world's digital skills gap. One of the ways we're doing this is by helping organizations deliver digital transformation more successfully through upskilling and reskilling.